Please be seated. Yes, please continue, Ms. Peck. Mr. President, if I can just answer your question first. I will try to do so without us having to go into a private session. I can just refer to uh, paragraph numbers. So if I can just refer to paragraph 2549, and your question uh, relates to um, the individuals who are identified there. Um, So what I can tell you is that um, bar one, and I'll come to him, none of these individuals identified are computed within the figure um, that uh, Dushan Yant reaches in his report, which is the figure of 5977, uh, which he takes from the DNA profiling in combination with ICMP's list. Uh, none of them appear uh, are com within that computation, save one, um, which uh, he is um, the one at C. And if you look at the uh, reference uh, there to the evidence, uh, what is revealed uh, by that is that KDZ045 only says that he heard this individual was killed in the woods but did not witness this. Uh, so that's in relation to that individual. Just going down the list, just from the top to the bottom, A, uh, he's identified on the ICMP's uh, list, that's P5913, uh, as surface remains, so he wouldn't be included in Yancey's figure. And B uh, is not, in, not identified, and you can see from the code in the ICMP list, by the code in the list you can see that he's not in one of the graves that has been included within uh, Dushan Yancey's computation. Uh, that's uh, B. Uh, so far as uh, there's the second B. Um, second B. Um, his name doesn't match clearly a name on the ICMP list, and the reason for that is there's no father's name provided. So I can't assist, but he's not been clearly identified as on the ICMP list. Uh, the next one, C. I believe I have already uh, covered uh, D. Uh, this one, too, there is no exact match for the name on the ICMP list. And E, um, and also F, both of those individuals are not, when you look at the code on the ICMP list, they're not in one of the graves that are included within Dushan Yance's computation. So I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Then going back to Mr. Karadzic's arguments, uh, the second main argument, the prosecution case is that over 7,000 Muslim men and boys were executed. This case is proven on the totality of the evidence. We rely upon four broad categories of evidence. DNA, direct evidence of the number of prisoners killed, evidence of the number of prisoners captured, and the demographic evidence of the number of people missing following the fall of Srebrenica. Turning to the DNA evidence first, we've discussed this in the Srebrenica narrative at paragraphs 169 to 171. For the reasons explained, the number of execution victims identified by DNA profiles in the Srebrenica-related grave is at least 5,850. This figure doesn't include any surface remains or any of the non-execution victims in the three mixed graves. It refers exclusively to numbers of known execution victims within the graves. But this is not the final number of Srebrenica execution victims. As more graves and bodies are identified in the coming years, this number will continue to increase. Then turning to the direct evidence, the evidence of individuals who were present, survivors, executioners, people involved in the burials, their evidence 
present at the detention, execution, and burial sites directly supports the prosecution's case that over 7,000 prisoners were executed. And I refer you to the relevant paragraphs in the Srebrenica narrative, paragraphs 54, 64, 97, 107, 114, 125 to 6, 135 to 8. Documentary and intercept evidence also supports the prosecution's case. One of the most compelling pieces of evidence about the number of prisoners killed is the intercept between Bayara and Kerstich, to which I have referred. Bayara explained on the 15th July that he still had 3,500 prisoners, parcels, to kill. That's site P5074. This was after the murders of over 3,000 Muslim men and boys in executions in Bratanats, Potichari, at Kravitzer Warehouse, Rahavats, and Petkopsi Dam. But crucially, before the executions at Kozluk, Branyevo Farm, Pilitsa Cultural Center, I refer to the Srebrenica narrative at paragraphs 34 to 35, 49 to 79, and 89 to 144. This was 15 July, the halfway point. Turning to the numbers of Muslim men who were captured, documentary evidence, witness evidence, and intercept evidence shows that over 7,000 prisoners were captured after the fall of Srebrenica. All of them were murdered. First, over 1,000 men and boys were detained in Potichari on 12th and 13th July. I refer to the prosecution brief, paragraph 895, and Janic's evidence at P1194 and pages 30, uh, at pages 31 to 32, and P372 at pages 20 to 23. Second, about 6,000 Muslim men surrendered or were captured from the column on 13 July. The site is an intercept dated 13 July at 5.30 p.m. As you'll recall, it's P4945. It reads, there are two conversions, X and Y. Why, there are, there are about three, uh, sorry, there are about 6,000 of them now. Of military age? Answer, shut up, don't repeat. Third, I refer you to a telex sent on 16 July by Christine Schmitz, the MSF nurse, Médecins Sans Frontières nurse in Potichari. She said, according to Franken, the VRS, quote, seemed to have already more than 7,000 POWs in Bratanats. That's P4757 at page two. I also refer you to the evidence of Franken the references paragraph 1024 of the prosecution brief. Your Honours, in addition, I refer you to all of the sites listed already in the prosecution brief at footnote 3099. Finally, in, in addition to those captured on the 13th July, hundreds more were captured and executed in the sweep operation in the subsequent days, including at Cerska. I refer you to the Srebrenica narrative, paragraphs 145 to 163. Finally, demographic evidence. The prosecution's demographic evidence shows that as of April 2012, 7,905 people were reported missing from Srebrenica, that's 7905. Of those 7,905 individuals, and I refer to the Srebrenica narrative at paragraph 172. At least 5,850 are known to, have to, to be execution victims through DNA profiling, as I've explained. Of the remaining individuals, many more must have been execution victims. This includes men whose remains were found on the surface and men whose remains have yet to be found. This is because of the tenacity with which Karadzic's subordinates sought to kill every last Bosnian Muslim from Srebrenica whom they could capture, including after the mass executions had ended. 
I refer to the Srebrenica narrative paragraphs 85 to 88, 139 to 140, 151 to 163, and P4965, and the prosecution brief paragraphs 1040 to 1042. Your Honours, Karadzic's demographic arguments at paragraphs 2522 to 2530 of his brief are vague and speculative. They are based on broad, imprecise estimates of numbers who were in the enclave, how many left for Potichari, and how many were bussed to Kladan. Karadzic then massages these figures misleadingly to support his argument. My last points on the numbers. Karadzic provides no basis in paragraph 2568 of his brief for excluding opportunistic killings from the scope of the JCU to eliminate. These prisoners were all marked for death. The fact that a few VRS or MOOP soldiers took advantage of this climate of impunity and killed several tens of victims at an earlier time than they would otherwise have been killed does not put these crimes outside the scope of the joint criminal enterprise to eliminate. Karadzic's suggestion in paragraph 2567 that the Kravitz of warehouse victims should be excluded from the total number of execution victims has no basis. Even if the burned hands incident, as he claims, triggered the start of the Kravitzer killings, it could not justify the cold-blooded, efficient, and metho methodical massacre of over 1,000 people. Your Honours, on the totality of the evidence, it can be conservatively concluded that over 7,000 Muslim men and boys from Srebrenica were executed, and I refer to paragraph 173 of the Srebrenica narrative. Your Honours, I'm going to deal with one of the questions you raised on Friday. It's question one, part two. Uh, I'll read it. Can the prosecution outline its position in simple terms as to the interplay between the overarching JCE and the Srebrenica JCE as well as the scope of each in terms of the underlying charges. Your Honours, the passage of events that I outlined at the outset describes the interplay between the overarching joint criminal enterprise and the joint criminal enterprise to eliminate. Directive 7 is evidence of the plan from March 1995 under the overarching joint criminal enterprise, specifically in relation to the Srebrenica enclave. It is also evidence of Karadzic's intent to forcibly remove the Bosnian Muslim civilian population from the Srebrenica enclave. The interplay between the JCEs, the two JCEs, is plain when examined in reference to counts seven and eight, that's deportation and forcible transfer. I refer your Honours, to paragraph 75 of the indictment. As a result of Karadzic's participation in the joint criminal enterprise to eliminate, he is responsible for the forcible transfer and deportation of the Bosnian Muslim women, children and elderly from the Srebrenica enclave. Under the JCE to eliminate, we do not seek a finding that Karadzic is responsible for the forcible transfer of the civilian component of the column of Muslim boys, men and boys, who fled Srebrenica on the night of 11 July. This is because from the moment he shared the criminal purpose to eliminate the Bosnian Muslims of Srebrenica, his intent in relation to the men was not to remove, but to kill them. His criminal responsibility should be classified accordingly. If you find there was no JCE to eliminate or that Karadzic was not a member, then he is nevertheless responsible for the forcible transfer of the Bosnian Muslim population. That would include the women and children and the men under the overarching JCE. I'm not sure I understand you, Ms. Park. 
in the previous paragraph, you said, under the JCE to eliminate. Yes. We do not seek a finding that Karadzic is responsible for the forcible transfer for the civilian component of the column. Uh, yes, you re refer to the column. Yes, uh, yes, yes. yes. I'm, I was mistaken, Dif thank you. Different, <laughs> yes. Uh, just because of the, uh, by then, the intent is to kill the men and boys. Thank Once you. we get into the JC to eliminate. Yes, I, I, I was mistaken. You're referring to the column at, at that time. Please continue. So, Your Honours, then I was going to deal with the other underlying charges as per the question and just go through each of them in relation to the Srebrenica uh, crime base. Um, for counts four, five, and six. Once, once again, I, my Perhaps apologies. I misunderstood the question. Uh, in, with respect to their interplay between the two joint criminal enterprise, what confuses me is that the you are the prosecution's inclusion of Podrinya section in the municipality narratives. Uh, in the indictment, Srebrenica was not included in the municipalities. No, uh, no, it, um, I think that's more a structural thing rather than a, an actual, uh, the, the way in which we're putting our case. And I think Mr. Teague addressed the topic of Director 4 and Director 7 and how the Podrinya summary fitted in yesterday in his submission, so I wasn't going to take it any further than that, but just to say in relation to J the JCE to eliminate, all of that is evidence and relevant to his intent, clearly, his long-standing intent to forcibly remove, which evolved into an intent to eliminate, destroy the Bosnian Muslim population by killing the men and removing everyone else. and. Then I will ask uh, Mr. Tiger to expand <laughs> on the on the connotation of inclusion of Podrinje in the municipality narratives. Do you follow, Mr. Tiger? I think so, Mr. President. I was just about to look at the indictment myself, but let me try to tackle this quickly and see if I can. The court just mentioned that Srebrenica was not included in the municipalities, but the structure of the indictment is that the municipalities are defined. Um, in the paragraph uh, addressing persecutions. Um, and then Srebrenica is also included. Um, the same structure applies to uh, forcible transfer. Then in the paragraphs I cited to you yesterday, the indictment makes crystal clear that Srebrenica is part of the overarching JCE along with the municipalities, um, and what is charged is persecutions um, and uh, forcible uh, deportation, forcible transfer. Those are in the paragraphs that alluded to um, what uh, I think they were, well, th they alluded to the fact that um, the municipalities were essentially cleansed uh, by the end of 1992, but not Srebrenica, um, that uh, there was still an effort to uh, conclude or complete the cleansing uh, of the Drina, um, as reflected in the attacks on Cherska and Konjevich Polya, the specific paragraph dealing with that. Um, it went on to say that uh, in March 95, under the auspices or, or encompassed by the overarching JCE, there was a plan, Directive 7, to then take Srebrenica. So until the point at which the JCE to eliminate commences, the indictment makes clear that Srebrenica, like the municipalities, is encompassed by the overarching JCE to the extent uh, it is charged within uh, count three and within forcible uh, transfer and deportations. I hope that makes it clear. I can, I, if I open the indictment up, I can refer you to particular. Yeah, and I can read that directly right now. For example, in count three, Radovan Karadzic is specifically charged for persecutions in the following municipalities. They are enumerated, then there's a parenthesis, quote, municipalities, they'll be referred to that uh, in that manner, comma, as well as persecutions of the Bosnian Muslims of Srebrenica. And, you, and you'll find the same for counts seven and eight uh, in, the, in the first uh, paragraph. 
which states Radovan Karadzic committed in concert with others, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the forcible transfer and deportation of Bosnian Muslims and Bosnian Croats from the municipalities and from Srebrenica. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Ms. Pe, and, please. And your, your Honours, in the passage of events that I was describing fit, as Mr. Tiger has indicated, when you look at the p relevant paragraphs under the counts for forcible transfer at 73, 74 and 75, he was referring at paragraph 73 to the events which led to the forcible displacement under the overarching JCE of Bosnian Muslims into the Srebrenica enclave. Then at paragraph 74, the, p the March 95 plan that is evidenced by Directive 7 to take over the enclave and forcibly transfer and deport its Bosnian Muslim population. That's all under the overarching JCE. And then the following paragraph 75 describes the formation of the uh, JCE to eliminate. So th that passage of events describes the interplay. And so far as the counts are concerned, uh, I've indicated uh, in relation to the JC, uh, in relation to the count of forcible transfer, what uh, what sort of findings the prosecution would seek, and in relation to the other charges, I can just take you through them, uh, Your Honours. There's counts four, five, and six. Um, he Karadzic is responsible under those counts, extermination and murder. I refer to paragraph 66 of the indictment. He's responsible through his membership of the JCE to eliminate for the Schedule E killings. And then for count three, persecution. For the killings at paragraph 60A and the forcible transfer and deportation of the women, young children and some elderly men, that's at paragraph 58 of the indictment. He's responsible under the JCE to eliminate and, and I refer to paragraph 58 of the indictment. And Your Honours, to be clear, if you find that Karadzic was a participant in the JC to eliminate, then we would seek a finding that he is responsible for the killings as persecution under the JC to eliminate, the more specific JCE in relation to Srebrenica. If you find that he was not a participant in the JC to eliminate, then we say in the alternative that he is responsible under the overarching JCE for the killings and for the forcible transfer of the men and the women and children for the reasons indicated by Mr. Tiger. And I refer to paragraphs 52 and 53 and 57 of the indictment. Similarly, for the beatings of the men prior to their execution at paragraph 60E of the indictment, Karadzic is responsible via the JCE to eliminate. For the terrorizing and abuse in Potichari, again at paragraph 60E, of the indictment, Karadzic <coughs> is responsible via the JCE to eliminate. Your Honours, I was going to move on to the next topic unless there was anything else I could do, say to assist. Please continue. I'm grateful. I'm going to deal with... Kindly Karadzic. slow down, please. Thank you very much. I'm going to deal with Karadzic's remaining arguments in relation to counts seven and eight, forcible transfer and deportation. I'll deal with the first two arguments briefly, then spend a bit of time on the last. First, Karadzic says he didn't intend to forcibly remove the Bosnian Muslim population from the enclave. There was no plan to remove them. That's the defense final brief at paragraphs 3308 and 3315. Karadzic says he took significant steps to ensure that the civilians should, could remain in Srebrenica and be safe. That's the defense brief at paragraphs 3320 and 3321. Your Honours, these claims are false. It was Karadzic's long-standing aim and intention, as I've discussed, since 1992, to forcibly remove the Bosnian Muslim population from the Srebrenica enclave, as the evidence shows. His actions evidence his intent to forcibly remove the population. He issued Directive 7, signed it. 
he established a committee to control the convoy approval process. And the site for that is D3279, and it's duplicate P4543. And I refer to the defense brief at paragraph 3343, footnote 6726, and the Podrinier summary at paragraph 31. And, Your Honours, from March to July 1995, Karadzic's plan to forcibly remove the civilian population from Srebrenica was implemented through a series of coercive acts. And these are described in the Podrinier summary and in the Srebrenica narrative. These acts implemented Directive 7. They were restricting unperformed humanita humanitarian aid convoys. That's in the Podrinier summary at paragraphs 33 to 37. Shelling and sniping, Podrinier summary, paragraphs 38 to 41. And the military attack on the enclave, that's the Srebrenica narrative, paragraphs 5 to 10. These acts had the aim and effect of making life unbearable for the Bosnian Muslim civilian population, just as Directive 7 provided. Karadzic approved the attack on the enclave. He ordered a takeover of the town. He set up civilian structures on the 11th of July. That's D2055 and P2994. And, Your Honours, his orders on the 9th July about protecting the civilian population and on the 11th July about ensuring that the civilian population could freely choose where they wanted to go were clearly not genuine. I refer to the argument in the defence brief, paragraphs 2403, 2405, and 3319. Karadzic also relies upon the statement signed in Potichari on 17 July by Franken and the Bosnian Muslim civilian representative, Manjic. He says that this shows he didn't know that the removal of the, po of the Muslim population from Potichari was forcible. I refer to the defence brief at paragraphs 3330, 3337, 3340, and footnote 6714. Your Honours, the, the 17 July statement did not reflect the reality of the situation. It was a sham produced days later, and we have addressed the context in which it was made and used in the prosecution brief at paragraphs 1034 to 1037. I don't propose repeating the arguments. Second, Karadzic says his order to attack and take over Srebrenica town was lawful. That's the defence final brief, paragraphs 2397 to 2399. Your Honours, the prosecution has always said that the Srebrenica enclave was never properly demilitarised. The ABIH did carry out military operations from the enclave. I refer to the defence brief at paragraph 2397 and to the adjudicated facts on this issue, numbers 1393 and 1394. But any arguably legitimate military aim in ordering an attack on the enclave is immaterial. There was an overriding criminal objective in ordering the attack on the enclave and the attack on the town. That objective was to forcibly drive out the civilian population. I refer to our final brief, prosecution final brief at paragraph 863. The indiscriminate and disproportionate attack on the Srebrenica enclave and town was designed to terrorize the civilian inhabitants of Srebrenica and instill fear, causing them to flee, and it did. I refer to the Srebrenica narrative at paragraphs 5 to 8. Third and finally, Karadzic argues that the removal of the Bosnian Muslim population from Potichari was not coercive or that this was not the intention. Karadzic claims that to this day, he believes that there was no forcible transfer of the Muslims from Srebrenica. I refer to the defence brief at paragraph 3349. I'll address a few of Karadzic's specific arguments that the UN... First, he says that the UN and Bosnian Muslim civilian leadership requested that the population be transported out and that this is evident 
evidence both that the Bosnian Serbs never intended to force the Muslim population to leave and that the Muslim population did not leave under coercive circumstances. Your Honours, first, the defence argument about the intent to forcibly remove ignores the context from March 1995, including as a result of the attack on the enclave, the Bosnian Muslim population of Srebrenica were subjected to a series of coercive acts. These acts implemented, as I've said, Karadzic's order number seven, as he said to Djurjevic, directive seven. Karadzic knew this. Other members of the JCE to eliminate, like Mladic, knew this. Your Honours, the mass exodus of the Bosnian Muslim population in Potichari was not the result of a voluntary request from the population. The women, children, and elderly men did not leave Potichari as a result of the exercise of genuine choice. The defense relies upon video recordings of the three meetings at the Hotel Fontana in Bratinac and what Mladic said at those meetings. That's the defense final brief paragraphs 2409 to 14, 2420 to 22, and 2426. Your Honours, all of Mladic's statements at these meetings were made in the context of his menace and his threats. The removal of the Bosnian Muslim women and children from Potichari was planned and organised as the main staff reported to Karadzic on the 13 July, I quote, there is an organized and planned transfer of the population from Srebrenica to the territory under Muslim control. That's P4464 at page three. Before the third meeting at the Hotel Fontana, the one at which the Bosnian Muslim representatives supposedly made it clear that they wanted to leave, that's the defense final brief, reference uh, paragraph 2425. The Drina Corps were uh, arranging buses to remove the Bosnian Muslim population from Potichari under Mladic's orders. I refer to the prosecution brief at uh, paragraph 898 and cites P4680, P4533 and D1971. I remind you of what Mladic said in an intercepted conversation at 12.50 on the 12th July. And you can see it. They've all capitulated and surrendered and will evacuate them all, those who want to and those who don't want to. That was the truth. There was no genuine choice. The site is P6694 for the public version, Your Honours, and P4254 for the confidential version. The defence brief suggests now, for the first time, that this intercept is not an accurate record. Uh, this is in the defence brief at paragraph 2431. Karadzic had the opportunity to put this claim to KDZ 357 in cross-examination, but he didn't. And, Your Honours, I refer you to KDZ 357's evidence about how this conversation was taped, played back, and transcribed. That's P4628 pages 30 to 34. There's no doubt that this is an accurate record of Mladic's conversation. The defense refers to another intercept between two unknown conversants, D2023. That's at paragraph 2428 of the defense brief. Your Honours, neither conversant can possibly be Mladic. That's plain. Mladic's intent is revealed by P6694, the intercept which identifies him as a speaker. Your Honours, I also refer you to the legal principle on this topic, with which, of course, you're familiar, that an agreement concluded between military commanders or other representatives of the parties in a conflict per se cannot make a displacement lawful. In addition, the assistance of humanitarian agencies like the UN in facilitating displacements does not of itself render an otherwise unlawful transfer lawful. One site for that is the Popovich trial judgment at paragraph 897. I think the defense would accept that, but it is not absolutely clear from the brief. Next, Karadzic says 
that had the civilian population sheltered in their homes or had the UN or the population requested that they be allowed to stay in Srebrenica, there is no evidence that the Bosnian Serbs would have never, nevertheless transported them out. That's the defense brief at paragraph 2438. This claim is false and utterly baseless. I'll give you an example. On 13 July, the elderly and infirm who had remained at the hospital in Srebrenica were forced to leave, threatened with death. I refer you to the Srebrenica narrative, paragraph 30, and the evidence of Joseph Kingori at P4140, paragraphs 185 to 186. On 17th July, as the Drina Corps command reported, two women who returned from Kladang were shot and killed because, quotes, they refused to surrender and began to run away. That's P3994, page 2. Next, Karadzic says, the Bosnian Serbs were not forcing the people in Potocari onto buses. That's the defence brief, paragraph 2432. Your Honours, the entire busing process was carried out in the presence and under the supervision of Bosnian Serb forces who had taken the enclave and surrounded Potocari. I refer to the Srebrenica narrative, paragraphs 11 to 27. The civilian population was under constant threat and intimidation. The use of dogs enhanced the atmosphere of oppression. I refer to the evidence of Momir Nikolic at D2081, page 2, Mesada Malagic at P356, page 25, P4934, which is Kovac's order about the dogs, and Kingori at P4140, paragraph 158. In addition, KDZ-167 at P354, page 6, and Shera Ibishevic at P401, page 2. The situation in Potocari was only worsened because the Bosnian Muslim population were rendered utterly helpless, vulnerable, and helpless as Dutchbat, the UN force designated to protect them, was disabled. That's the Srebrenica narrative, paragraph 33. Busing, the final act, confirmed that the Bosnian Muslim population had no option but to leave. And women and children were also forced onto buses. I refer to the Srebrenica narrative, paragraph 15. And to the evidence described in that paragraph, I add the following references. Uh, Patelski at P4173, paragraph 25. Kingori at P4140, paragraph 172, and Malagic at transcript 23488-23489. Your Honours, most significantly, the women, children, and elderly were forcibly separated from their men and boys. These separations were part of the process. Let me remind you of the evidence of KDZ-265, the mother whose 14-year-old child was taken from her as she was moved onto the buses. There was nothing about this process that involved an exercise of genuine choice. Your Honours, there is sufficient evidence upon which you must find Karadzic is guilty of the crimes charged in counts 7 and 8 in relation to Srebrenica. Finally, Your Honours, returning to count 2, <coughs> genocide. Karadzic marked the Bosnian Muslim population of Srebrenica for extinction. His subordinates stripped the men and boys of their personal belongings and identification and deliberately and methodically killed them solely on the basis of their identity. His forces caused serious physical and mental harm to the men who survived miraculously and to the women and children of Srebrenica. Women and children who were separated 
from their sons, fathers, husbands, brothers, taken from their homes, their lives shattered. In the prosecution brief, we have discussed the genocidal acts, the murders and the serious physical and mental harm suffered by the men who survived and the women and children who endured the separations, the murders of their men and boys, and who were removed from the Srebrenica enclave en masse. The men who survived have suffered trauma and injury. Their fear and their anguish as they waited to die is unimaginable. KDZ 069 survived. Mr. Teague has referred to him already. He said as others were being killed, quote, I was praying that I be killed too because I was in terrible pain but I dared not call out to them. So I just thought my mother would never know where I was as I was thinking that I'd like to die. That's P339, <coughs> page 41. The collective sudden suffering of the survivors who lost so many of their men, their bodies missing for so many years, has been described as Srebrenica syndrome. I refer to the evidence of Ibrahim Efendic. That's P4646. Prosecution witness Mesada Malagic described how, I quote, with the fall of Srebrenica, rather when it was taken by Serb soldiers and when the Serb soldiers took that so-called protected area by the United Nations, from the face of the earth were wiped out, wiped off three generations of men in the cruelest way possible. Site is P356, page 44. Remember KDZ265, again, I've talked about her evidence, she was asked when she testified in the Kersich case, what do you think has happened to your husband and your two sons? It's P367, page 20. She imagined her son, her 14-year-old son, his little hands, picking strawberries, reading books, going to school, going on excursions. She said, every morning I wake up, I cover my eyes, not to look at other children going to school and husbands going to work, holding hands. Your Honours, the evidence condemns Mr. Karadzic. He bears responsibility for the pain and the suffering of these women, for the murders and the pain and the suffering of the men and the women and the children of Srebrenica. He bears responsibility for their suffering, which is lasting and devastating. Your Honours, he bears responsibility. He is guilty of genocide. And I refer back to Mr. Teagan. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peck. Yes, Mr. Teagan. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> you have heard over the course of this case what the President of the Red Cross rightfully called the sad picture. In the municipalities, destroyed communities, thousands and thousands of civilians murdered, many thousands more tormented and abused in the abominable camp network, hundreds of thousands forcibly expelled, turned into homeless refugees. Sarajevo, the terrorization of an entire European capital city for years through murderous bombardments, random shellings, or by picking men, women, and children off one by one. Hostages, using the lives of human beings as bargaining chips in front of the entire world. And Srebrenica, as you've just heard, the mass executions of thousands of men and boys, coupled with the by then practiced efficiency of mass expulsion of the remainder of the population. 
cruelties upon countless victims, one by one by one by one. Individual tragedies collectively too vast to comprehend. And what all these crimes have in common is Radovan Karadzic, who once proudly took credit for what his army, his police, his civilian authorities had done to implement his policy, but who now tries to run from them. The time has come for Karadzic to face responsibility for those acts. The insincerity of his expression of regret and, quote, moral responsibility, unquote, for the sufferings inflicted on his victims is exposed by his revisionist defense orchestrated years ago. Mendacious claims that rub salt in the wounds of each and every living victim, many of whom suffer to this day without their loved ones in continuing physical and emotional pain, all trying with varying success to face down the nightmare of the past on a daily basis. Your Honors, justice for all these victims requires nothing short of a life sentence. This concludes the prosecution submissions, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. T. We'll adjourn for today, and tomorrow we'll be continue at 9 o'clock. All rise. We have a